And when thou wouldst solace gather, when our child's first accents flow, wilt thou teach her to say father, though his care she must forego? Those are the words of a poet named Lord Byron, written about his daughter Ada, as he was separating from her mother just weeks after Ada was born. Ada would marry and go on to become Ada King, Countess of Lovelace, or known as Ada Lovelace. And she's often referred to as the first ever computer programmer. That is all I had heard about her until recently, when I wondered, what does that really mean? And is it even true? Well, the best way to find out is to read the document that she's famous for. It's the only paper that she published, and it's called Sketch of the Analytical Engine. It is this document that will allow us to understand Ada's role in the history of computing. So in this video, I would like to go through it with you. It describes the analytical engine invented by Charles Babbage, which was a monstrously ambitious steam-powered computer. And that will cover the mechanical aspects of the engine, just enough to be able to understand some of the programs that Ada wrote for it. Gossip about her private affairs, gambling, and interesting philosophies, although fascinating, will have to be left for another video. A sketch of the analytical engine was published in 1843, and the first part of it was a paper published by an Italian mathematician who would actually go on to become the Prime Minister of Italy, Luigi Menabrea. Ada translated his work into English and then added her own notes to it, and these notes were twice as long as the original paper. At the time, Ada had already been acquainted with Charles Babbage for a number of years and had been working alongside him to understand the engine. It was in these notes that she included an algorithm that could use the engine to compute Bernoulli numbers, and it is this which is called the first computer program. She also notes that the engine could be used to do things other than arithmetic and computations. She has this idea that quantities other than numbers could be represented in the engine and could therefore go on to be used for things like composing music. This insight and vision, a uh, hundred years before Alan Turing would come along with his own ideas of the modern computer, are really quite remarkable and is something that she definitely deserves to be credited for as well. So let's start at the beginning. It was Charles Babbage who was the mastermind behind this first computer and he was frustrated by mistakes that crept into logarithm tables used back then for calculations. He wanted to execute by means of machinery the mechanical branch of scientific labours reserving for pure intellect that which depends on reasoning. So really he wants to free up the scientist's mind. Charles Babbage first came up with the difference engine and in this example here we have the series of whole square numbers 1, 4, 9, 16, 25 and so on. If we find the difference between each of these numbers we'll get a new series 3, 5, 7, 9, 11 and the difference between each of these numbers is always equal to 2. That is shown in this table here. And from this, if we were given just the numbers 2, 5, and 9, we would be able to reconstruct this entire series of square numbers just through a series of additions. For the machine, we would have three dials, A, B, and C, and also two hammers, so if we start by placing needle C on 2, needle B on 5, and needle A on 9, then the hammer on C will strike twice, adding 2 onto needle B. So B will now read 7. It will then strike its hammer 7 times, adding 7 onto 9, and giving us the result 16. If we recommence these operations, beginning with the needle C, which is always to be left on 2, we will successively reproduce the series of whole square numbers by means of a very simple mechanism. Babbage himself ran out of money to ever finish building the difference engine, although he did have a small model of it. 
Since then, some clever people have finished it for him and made a complete version. Babbage kind of got distracted by his idea for a second type of engine, one that could do a lot more and was much more ambitious. This was the analytical engine. The analytical engine can perform addition, subtraction, multiplication and division, and is therefore capable of performing every species of numerical calculation. For the analytical engine, we have a series of vertical columns consisting of a number of circular disks. The first disk represents units, the second tens, the third hundreds, and so on. Babbage's notes showed as many as 40 disks, so you could have quite some precision. They haven't had the idea of using binary numbers, so everything is in decimal. We denote these columns with V for variable, and for example, if we wanted to add the numbers on V1 and V4 together, we would then place the result on a third column, we could call that V7. The act of adding the numbers together will occur at a place on the engine called the mill. The mill is the portion of the machine which works, and the columns of variables constitute that where the results are represented and arranged. So in modern computing notation, the mill may be called the CPU, and the columns of variables, this big extension out the back of the machine, would be called the store or the memory. You may wonder how the machine knows which operations to perform and which variables to include. And the solution has been taken from Jacquard's apparatus. What they're talking about here is using punch cards that were first used in Jacquard's loom, something that was used to make intricate patterns in lace and other materials by using a series of cards as the instructions. There are two main types of cards that will allow us to program the engine. The first are the operation cards. And these are telling the machine if you want to perform addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division. And the second type of card is the card of the variables, which indicate to the machine the columns on which the results are to be represented. There's then a fairly brief example, and you may even want to call this the first computer program, since it's the first example in the notes. But it's much more simple than the Bernoulli program, which will appear later. In this, we have two simultaneous equations, and say that we want to solve for x, well, we can rearrange these equations into this fraction here. Then we assign our eight variables to eight different columns. n and n dash have been represented twice, probably because they will need to be used twice in separate parts of the calculation. This table then gives an idea of the cards that would be needed to execute this. Here we have the number of the operation, so first step, second step, third step, and so on. Then in the next column here, these are our set of operation cards. They're just saying that we're either performing a multiplication, a subtraction, or a division. And these are the cards of the variables, telling the machine which variables are involved in each of these operations. So we have here v2 times v4, and that result is going to be put on the column v8. This box here just shows what we're doing. That was the step of multiplying d by n dash. Following all these steps, and the last one will end up giving you the result for x. Since the cards just tell the machine what columns and what operations to do, we still need to enter the initial numerical data ourselves, so there's still a little bit of room for human error in here. What's interesting is that the method of running the engine is actually Turing complete, which wasn't a phrase that existed at the time, but essentially means it would be able to perform any computation, although in this case it is limited by being steam powered. We are now onto the first of Ada's notes. This one is note A. It is quite philosophical and poetic. She says in it that the machine might act upon other things besides number. Supposing, for instance, 
that the fundamental relations of pitched sounds in the science of harmony and of musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. She says that whether the inventor of this engine had any such views in his mind while working out the invention, or whether he may subsequently ever have regarded it under this phase, we do not know, but it is one that forcibly occurred to ourselves on becoming acquainted with the means through which analytical combinations are actually attained by the mechanism. She's saying that there are some things that are very clear to her, but she's not sure if Charles Babbage even shares the same views. She even speaks of the intrinsic beauty of the mathematics behind this. She says that this science constitutes the language through which alone we can adequately express the great facts of the natural world, those who thus think on mathematical truth as the instrument through which the weak mind of a man can most effectually read his creator's works, will regard with special interest all that can tend to facilitate the translation of its principles into explicit practical forms. I love this sentence here where she says that the analytical engine weaves algebraic patterns just as the jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. She's seeing how they can take the beautiful patterns from lace and material and translate that into the beauty of mathematics. The other big idea that she deserves to be remembered for is recognizing that the analytical engine is unlike anything before it. She says here that the engine does not occupy common ground with mere calculating machines. And she spends a lot of the notes pointing out the differences between the difference engine and this much more powerful analytical engine. Doing so was important in its own right, but it was also slightly political in a way, because Charles Babbage was trying really hard to get enough funding for it to build his analytical engine, and with his track record of running out of money to build the difference engine, he was really struggling to convince people of its value and of its difference. Ada then says something which still rings true today in the pursuit of trying to convince people that doing research or building machines or projects that might not have as much immediate value can still bring a lot of value down the line that we are not even aware of. She says, those who incline to very strictly utilitarian views may perhaps feel that the peculiar powers of the analytical engine bear upon questions of abstract and speculative science, rather than upon those involving everyday and ordinary human interests. These persons being likely to possess but little sympathy or possibly acquaintance with any branches of science which they do not find to be useful according to their definition of that word, may conceive that the undertaking of that engine, now that the other one is already in progress, would be a barren and unproductive laying out of yet more money and labour. However, she continues that while some of the results of the analytical engine may be known now, Others, which it may not yet be possible to foresee, but which would be brought forth by the daily increasing requirements of science, and with practical acquaintance with the powers of the engine, were it in actual existence. She sounds like anyone today trying to justify some of these more abstract or blue sky research ideas in mathematics or even things like investing in space technology and exploration. Unfortunately, due to the lack of funds and lack of mechanical and technical abilities back then, they weren't able to actually build the analytical engine. And I wonder what kind of insights and developments might have happened if they actually had one of these in existence. It would be quite a long time before we would converge back on these ideas. Let's move on to Ada's last note, the famous note G. It starts off with a comment that is surprisingly relevant here. 
She says that in considering any new subject, there is frequently a tendency first to overrate what we find to be already interesting or remarkable, and secondly, by a sort of natural reaction to undervalue the true state of the case when we do discover that our notions have surpassed those that were really tenable. She may be talking about the engine and not wanting to overstate its abilities, but the sentiment also is true for her role in the history of computing. With the claims that she is the first ever computer programmer, perhaps she has been sometimes overrated. But then when people look more into the case and start to say, well, you know, Charles Babbage has written programs of his own in, in some of his notes, there is a risk to undervalue the true work that Ada has done. And we shouldn't do that because through these notes, I hope that it comes across that she speaks with intelligence, with a lot of knowledge of the analytical engine and of its potential in a way that nobody else at the time did. And she definitely deserves to be valued. And now, finally, we get to the really juicy stuff, which is this computer program to compute the numbers of Bernoulli. The Bernoulli numbers are involved with trying to calculate the sum of positive integers to any given power. Throughout history, a lot of people tried to do this and it was really difficult. Jacob Bernoulli came up with a way to do this, which wasn't quite easy, but at least was easier than any other method. He found that the sum of the first positive n integers to any given power followed a pattern, and the coefficients of each term in this pattern could be broken down into two factors. One set of these factors, the a's, could be obtained from Pascal's triangle, and the other set, the b's, were called the Bernoulli numbers. And they themselves followed a pattern and could be worked out using what's in the box up here. Ada herself acknowledges in the notes that this is a rather complicated example to be given and not that easy to follow the mathematical derivation, but she gives it as a way to illustrate the very powerful abilities of the engine. Her program computes these Bernoulli numbers and it does so in terms of all the preceding ones. She says that she appends to this note a diagram and table containing the details of the computation for B7, given B1, B3, and B5. And this is that program. It's computing B to the 2n minus 1 in the case of n being equal to 4. We have the number of operation that we're up to, and we have the operation cards in here, multiply, subtract, add and divide. We then have the variable cards telling us which variables are involved in the operation and where their result will go. We also have this indication of change in the value on any variable to keep track of variable columns that are changing. We have our statement of results to see what step in the computation we are up to. And then we have written here what our variables actually are. In our case, there will be six inputs into the program. We will need to put in one, two, our n, which is four, and b1, b3, and b5. That's what we need to get to b7, although we are actually working out these values as we go if we had have stopped earlier in the process before we got to b7. In this very first step, where we multiply v2 by v3, we multiply 2 by n, and we put the result 2n onto these three columns here, because we're going to want to use those later. We return the 2 and the n back to where they came from, because we're also going to want to use those again. In the case where we don't use the value again, we replace it with a 0. So we proceed through some of the steps of the algebra here. And the last line in this first section here is doing n minus one equal to three. We're taking our 
column where n is stored, so it was initially 4, and we're subtracting 1 from it to be left with a new n which is equal to 3. Because n is now equal to 3, we're going to continue on the process and then in the next step we'll decrease n to 2 and so on. The section of lines down here, 13 to 23, are very interesting because every time n increases, we just need to do an additional repetition of these operations, 13 to 23. Because of that, when n is bigger than 2, 25 operation cards are used, but no more are needed, regardless of how great n may be. We will, however, have to add more variable cards every time n goes up, and Ada refers to this as being a cycle of operations. And since these operations use the same pairs of columns, they are actually a cycle of variable cards. So this computer kind of has loops. It might not be a for loop or a while loop, but it is a loop of cards that can be fed back into the machine to continue computing the same cycle of operations over and over again. And down here, she shows what that looks like. She says that applying the notation for cycles, we may express the operations for computing the numbers of Bernoulli in the following manner. For B1, B3, B5, and B7, we all have the same initial set of seven operations. We finish with the same pair of operations at the end. In the middle, we might have this set of operations from eight to 12, and then a cycle of operations repeating those from line 13 to 23. With a general formula down here to compute any Bernoulli number. And what you're looking at here is the seed of computer programming that would go on to be so prevalent and so important to run our modern world. Ada died nine years after the paper was published, but nobody involved in the project lived long enough to see the dream be realized. In fact, we still haven't built a version of the analytical engine, although I think it is still a dream of many people. Ada was motivated and highly intelligent, and she was definitely the first person to clearly communicate the ideas of a substantial computer program. Charles Babbage had, of course, written smaller programs in his own notes, since he is the person who came up with how the engine would work and he did help Ada with a lot of the mathematics, but it was her who wrote it down and wrote it down in a way that made it clear what this engine was capable of. And maybe it was her who saw more than Babbage did what really the potential was that they were dealing with. It was very rare in these times for a woman to even have a mathematical education, but Ada did. And the reason that she did was because Ada's mother tried very hard to steer Ada away from becoming like her poet father, Lord Byron. She didn't want Ada to study poetry or literature or things like that. Instead, she steered her into studying mathematics and science, hoping that that wouldn't result in her sharing the same madness that Ada's mother saw in Ada's father. However, it wasn't so easy to completely remove poetic tendencies from Ada because she saw her approach kind of as a poetic science. Perhaps it was those poetic tendencies that allowed her to see the far-reaching potentials of this technology and to see beyond its pure mathematical abilities. In the end, Ada chose to be buried alongside her father, and although their accomplishments were very different, I guess there was a thread that tied them together. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters for making these videos possible, and a reminder that I've started a podcast over on my Patreon called Natural Wonders, and there are five episodes up already. A special shout out to today's Patreon cat of the day, Punk Rock. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you next time.